Welcome to Pick Up and Deliver, the podcast where I pick up my audio recorder as I step out for a walk and deliver an episode to you while I stroll around. I'm Brendan Riley. Well, good afternoon, listeners. It's a lovely day here in suburban Chicago. In fact, it's just over 80 degrees toward the end of September. Too warm for this time of month, but hopefully we'll blast past the last couple of days of warm summer and we'll be into cool autumn. So I got to play Coimbra the other night and it got me thinking about what makes me really like burn, brain burning games. This is certainly a subject I've talked about before on the podcast, so apologies if it's repetitive, but I think I've got a different angle on it this time. It feels different anyway. It might turn out I did this a hundred episodes ago and y'all could go on the forums and scold me, but I don't know, walk down this lane with me anyway and see if it's interesting. So I was thinking about is, what is it, what are the different ways that a brain will melt, a game will melt my brain and I will love it for having done so? That's my question. So to begin with, uh, Coimbra, the game I was just talking about. Uh, Coimbra is a release, it's not super new, it's maybe five years old now, uh, probably. Could be a little newer than that. Uh, Coimbra is six years old, was designed by Flaminia Brassini and Vir Virginio Gigli, and Chris Williams is the artist. Uh, there's another game that followed up called Alma Mater, which I still, I, th I think we almost played it once, um, but it had a similar feel to it and a similar look. The game is about um, Renaissance era Portugal, and in the game you are trying to, you are trying to win influence with important people, and build up your influence in Portugal. It is your standard sort of Euro game theme. What makes Coimbra really clever, and the thing that makes me like it so much, is that it has four currencies. You have shields, which are sort of defense, I guess, coins, you have travel, and you have points. Uh, and each of those different currencies benefits you in different ways, um, and you have to sort of manipulate all four to do well in the game. But the mechanism by which you draft your cards, and the cards, like I said, are uh, influential Portuguese people, these cards represent the significant element of the game. Getting these cards gives you, does everything else. And you get these cards by drafting dice. And this is the part that, just, that blows my mind. So there's a bunch of dice in three different colors. And on your turn, or at the beginning of the round, with the dice are rolled, and then you draft a die, and you play it into the tableau or you put it into one of the bidding rows, and you're, you're bidding to get one of these different benefit things. When, you take, when you're bidding, the value of the die, the number of pips on the die, is the important part of it. You're going to pay, you, uh, you're going to pay that much for whatever you get, but you also get to go first in what you choose. So there's four cards available, you put a die out there with a six, you're gonna pay six of the currency required to buy that card, but then you get to get the card. So that's, that's what the value of the die is for. But then also, in the income round, you get income based on the color of the die that you took. And that, that is the brain burning part that I find incredible in this game. Uh, along with the fact that there are two different currencies you might pay with, and four different currencies you could be rewarded with, or four different rewards, two of them are being currency. But the fact that you have to manage two currencies in each card, some of the cards use one currency, some of the cards use the other, that part's really compelling. But then on top of it, the fact that you have to think about the, both the color and the value of the die when you draft it, that just, it's amazing. And it makes the game really crunchy. It makes your brain hurt. Also, every card does something different, so you're constantly having to figure out what they are. So I love that kind of thing. And I'm thinking of that as sort of um, when one resource has multiple meanings, it's kind of like a many, like a multiple use card, except you get to do all the things with it. That's really compelling to me and makes for a really great game. So that's Coimbra. That's the first kind of brain melting is this many meanings. When you're making a choice that has multiple ramifications in the choice, I find that really compelling. I was trying to think of other games that I have that have a similar kind of multi-layered choice when you're picking one. And I'm, I'm having trouble thinking of one, honestly. Uh, you might be able to point to the, the tile selection in... Maybe, uh, okay, yeah, actually I think of two more. Uh, in Cascadia, you're picking both the land tile and the animal, and each of those are scoring in different ways. And you also could then switch which animal tile and which 
um, land tile you're picking using some of your bonuses. So I guess Cascadia is a more narrow version of that, less brain burning. And then on the other side of it, uh, you have something like, what was the, oh, Praga Kaput Regni, which also has the multi-layered selection. It's got that wheel with the different tiles on it. And when you pick it, you're choosing one half of the tile to play, but you also get the bonus for the spot that it's on on the wheel. So there's a multivalent choice that you're making there. So multivalent choices is step one. Uh, the second kind of brain burning is managing multiple fast wind conditions. You know, that lately I've been playing a lot of PAX Premier 2nd Edition and PAX Renaissance 2nd Edition, uh, and then always Innovation. All three of those games have multiple win conditions that you can pursue. The first two more than Innovation, but Innovation has multiple paths you could take toward the single win condition or the, the win conditions. But I love games where you have to keep an eye on these multiple things. Maybe that's what I like about PAX Renaissance. Nanti Narking, which is a game I've mentioned a number of times, it's also related to Discworld on Mor Ankh Morpork. Both of these are games where the condition of winning is variable and difficult to track, and you have to kind of watch, keep lots of different balls in the air and keep an eye on lots of different things because people might win in a variety of different ways. I love the way that burns my brain as well. You can see a little of that also in the Dune, the original Dune board game, or the one, I, the one I've played more is also Rex. Um, but they both have the same condition, which is this idea of people could be winning in a couple different ways and you gotta keep an eye on those different things. Uh, probably the height of that for me is Pax Renaissance. Because Pax Premier, there's like two different ways that you can win when the dominance card comes out, but they're kind of related. In Pax Renaissance, there's literally four different ways to win the game, and they're all different, so it's very complicated. I've played it online a bunch of times. I can't imagine playing it in person. It must be very difficult to track everything, because I bet in person you don't get that auto tracker like you have in, in Pax Renaissance Online. You can see like how many uh, bishops does this person have and how many whatever. That's all not tracked, I doubt, in the face-to-face -face version of Pax Renaissance. So having many choices, many paths to take toward victory is really compelling. You also see this in, you know, other than anti narking I would say A Study in Emerald is another game where there's just so many different ways you could go to earn points, but you know, you're all, you're all converging on the same thing, which is uh, triggering the end game. All right, third, the third way that my brain melts that I love is hard decisions, often overlapping with multi-use cards. So, you know, the preeminent version of this is Race for the Galaxy. If you want just a distilled down to the perfection of multi-use cards and hard decisions, but the height of that achievement for me is Glory to Rome and it's Glory to Rome and Matainai. Both of these games involve really intense multi-use cards that when you use them for one thing, then you lose the option to use them for another. And it's that, that really difficult choice of like, oh, I have this thing, I don't want to give it up, but I have to pay for it and giving it up. Or if, the, if I use it in this way, I can't use it in that way. Those irrevocable choices, particularly in a game with a relatively complex set of options, is fascinating and very entertaining as a game mechanism. I love when I have to make a difficult choice, sort of working between those different options. Uh, Race for the Galaxy is sort of, like I said, the distilled version of that that works really well because just you get a bunch of cards and each card does something awesome, but you can't use them. You have to pay with the cards. A more contemporary, a more recent version of that same thing is uh, Fantasy Realms does this, right? The struggle of like, which combo do I want to lean into? Or uh, more recently than that, Forest Shuffle is an excellent example of a game where you get points by building up these combos and uh, you're constantly sort of trying to decide to, because uh, you have to pay for cards with other cards. So you draw a card and it's great, and you draw another card and it's great, and you draw another card and it's great, and you can play up one of the three and the other two get discarded. And it's uh, delightful. So that's uh, hard decisions. It's the third way that I love melting my brain with board games. Uh, the fourth one, I'm just gonna call it big systems. And this would be like what you would call the heaviest, crunchiest Euro. 
right? Like the Vital Lacerda games like On Mars or Lisboa or Inventions um, or uh, the Mind Clash, the really good Mind Clash game like Tricarion is a great example of this. Games where scoring points is about manipulating an elaborate set of systems, finding uh, efficiencies in the niches and corners of those systems, keeping the whole system in your head and manipulating your pieces and the other players, players' pieces so they kind of get resolved in the right order so that you can execute the difficult things that that system represents. Now, if it sounds like it was confusing to explain what it is that's melting my brain, yeah, that's because it's confusing. I mean, take, for example, the Vital Asserta games, something like Invention. Invention is the one I played recently. Ooh, I see a turkey buzzard or turkey vulture. Take Inventions, for example, or On Mars. On Mars is maybe even a better one. Because in On Mars, whenever you want to do something, you have to pay resources. And those resources are often generated by cards that you get by paying other, or you know, think buildings you make or things you do by generating other resources. And it's kind of this cycle, the cyclical, it's kind of the cyclical cycle that you're part of, and you can't, there's no there's no clear spot that you're not part of it. And so it's consistently difficult to find where you would leap into that exchange in order to, in order to start that process working. It also, usually the economies in these systems are really tight. Tracarion is the best example of this for me. Although Anachrony does it as well, where the economy is really tight. And so then in order to do something, you have to kind of think about like, okay, if I do that, then I'm gonna have this many of that left. Tricarion in particular is really good because you have to have the money to pay your crew at the end of the round. You have to pay money to buy supplies. You have to have the right supplies to to construct the tricks and to put the, you have to have the right people to put the tricks into the display. You have to get everything organized so that when you perform, the tricks are all connected. You want to be ready to perform if one of your opponents goes. You want to look forward to the expensive tricks and so you got to think about the order of the tricks you're going to build when you are getting the lighter tricks. It's an excellent just cascade of different effects that makes for a fantastic game. I really like it. Uh, Tricarion is one of the best that does exactly what I'm talking about here. So, uh, and that's big systems. That, I don't know if that's my favorite, that might be my favorite brain melting thing or second favorite at least, probably second favorite because my favorite brain melting thing is related and often part of the big systems issue. But what melts my brain in a game like a Vital Asserta game sometimes is this last effect, but often it's just keeping in mind all the things I want to do. Like often in a Vital Asserta game, when you make a mistake, it's that you did things out of order or you did things in a way that you didn't get that bonus that you could have gotten had you done things in a different order. By contrast, this last effect, which I maybe talked about on the first episode of this podcast, this is definitely the most repeated idea on Pick Up and Deliver, is the idea of not quite enough. This is my favorite feeling in board games, even though it is a feeling of frustration, is the feeling of like having a thing you want to do, having just the right amount of stuff to do it, but then like you're like $1 short uh, or $2 short. And what's really compelling then is if you are able to manipulate the situation so that you can find that one dollar like finding exactly the right amount of money to do the thing you want to do that is such a huge payoff it really makes a game fantastic hello and of course the designer who hits that note most solidly for me most of the time is vladimir suchi vladimir suchi in last will vladimir suchi in underwater cities vladimir suchi in praga kaput regni in uh, evacuation, although I've only played that the once, so I'm not as familiar. In Messina 1342 or 1347. Uh, Woodcraft also felt that way, although again, I haven't played that as much. In each of the shipyard does it too. In each of these games, he builds this intricate system, but it's not quite as elaborate as the systems in the Vital Asserta games. There's not quite as much to keep track of there. It's a little smaller. Uh, and they are point salad games, so there's tons of different stuff to do. But in order to do it, you got to have just, just the right amount of things. And you never have quite enough. And I love it because you're constantly just, how can I wheedle out one more of this or one more of that? How can I find one, you know, use this benefit to just the right amount? And uh, the payoff on that is phenomenal. 
what makes his games really sing and the thing I like about his games the most. I'm, I'm sort of reminded also, as I think of this, of Stefan Feld games. I would say the big difference is, like Stefan Feld, the systems aren't as complex as a Vital Lacerda, and the economies generally aren't as tight as a Vladimir Suchi game. Like, usually in a Stefan Feld game, it's more about, like, picking the most efficient way to get to lots of points and still maintain your economy, or however you pay for the things you're doing, uh, and finding the efficiencies. But it's often, it doesn't have the same crushing, I almost have enough to do it feeling that those other games do. You know, if Stefan Feld made the economies in his games just a little tighter, they would probably have that feel. But I don't know that they would be as fun, because part of what's fun about his games is, you know, building up the elaborate store of things you might do with them. Uh, and that is super compelling to me. Uh, so that is the not the idea of not quite enough. So those are the different ways that having a game melt my brain is fun for me. I'm curious, having shared that, what are the kinds of games that make your brain melt? Do you have games in these categories? The uh, many meanings of, of options, the many choices for paths to victory, the hard decisions about choosing and excluding things, the huge systems you have to try to carry in your head, or the feeling of not quite enough that comes when the economy is just cranked just, just to the right amount. Any of those systems that work for you, I want to hear about it. And the place I want to hear about it is over on Board Game Geek in Guild 3269. I'd love to hear your thoughts on these issues and what you have to say about them. So that's about it for me today. Thanks for joining me on my walk. I hope that your next walk is as pleasant as mine was. Bye-bye. Brought to you by Rattlebox Games. Yeah, yeah, yeah.